What's up artists and art lovers, this is Lost. And this is a brand new series on my channel where I'm going to be going through my artworks and explaining my process and how I made them. You will also get a little bit of insight into what I was thinking while making it, along with some fun and cool programs you can use that might help your process a bit. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get to the artwork. So first up, there was a slight style change to my current artwork. I was looking to simplify my style as it felt, especially lately, there was too much going on in my artwork and it was just cluttered and messy. It was always too busy and harsh to look at. So I ended up going on a hunt on Pixip to look for artists with more simplistic, cut back styles that I could reference off of and maybe help guide me in my style change. I found one artist I really liked who was named Zolin. I'm probably butchering the enunciation because I'm terrible at names. I, I can't read. I, I suck at reading. I wrote this script and I can barely read it. I suck. So with the artist in mind, I gathered a few artworks that gave me the vibe and goal I was going for. I then put them in Pure Ref. By the way, I highly recommend Pure Ref. Especially if you have a second monitor, it can really help you to create a mood board and just organize things better than putting them in a program and hoping and moving things around. It's also free, but I would ask that if you really like the program, you're able to donate to them and help support the project. You know, throw a few dollars their way. So fun fact about me, I can't hold an image in my head for longer than a split second. So I will never be able to draw from my head. I always have to go and just improvise things. So this is why it's so important for me to have references. Now that I have a reference, I can kind of draw something similar, but change up the pose to make it my own, then change what the character's wearing to make it unique. So that's as simple as looking at the reference, drawing a torso or a body and changing the arm positions, changing the legs, kind of just fiddle around and see what works. I had to change the legs many times in this sketch because I just blew it. I would say that is kind of a benefit though, not being able to see things in my head. I never feel like I'm discouraged or can't draw what's in my head like I see some artists have to deal with. I guess in that regard, I'm lucky because every new artwork is a puzzle and a challenge that is to be solved and that keeps it fresh and fun for me. So that's a fun, weird fact. So once I finish the sketch, I then color it. I then add a multiply layer on top to block out the shadows. This is an important step because it helps you plan out your artwork and will tell you if the idea you have works or not. I then add an add glow layer on top to make the brighter parts of the character pop more. I then add some post-processing to make it look a bit more like the final product, just to make sure it looks good in the final stages. And then it's time for the line art. So much like Obi-Wan and Sith Lords, line art is kind of my speciality. It's a process I deeply love, even though other artists seem to really, really hate it. I don't know, I just find it really relaxing. The big thing to think about when dealing with line art is weight and dynamics. You should have varying levels of thickness in your lines, not just from pen pressure, but also for ambient occlusion, which is the places where light finds difficulty to reach. So think like tight spaces and corners. You'll see it all over my line art. It definitely makes it pop more and it just, it looks, mm, I love line art. So I use the Each Knee Song shadowing method, which is covered by a few other artists online. I will actually leave a link in the description of another artist who covers it way better than I do. But I'm gonna try to explain it a little bit here myself as well. So the first thing we need to do is define our light source. And the way we do that is we take the base color and we add a very light shadow on top. I then what I'll do is I'll start to erase the shadow and really clear out and define where the lights are. That's definitely the most efficient way that I've found to do it is use subtractive rendering. I then move on to part two, which is the harder shadows. The stuff that really um, adds a third dimension to it. And then the final step is to add in the ambient occlusion. The same way we did with our line art, we wanna make sure corners and hard to reach areas for light have a, a noticeable shading to it that really helps define everything. You can also add a shadow in between steps two and three, but 
I don't really do it that much, even though sometimes it's nice. Like, the only place I really tend to do it is in the hair. But lately, I've actually stopped doing that because I just want my colors to pop. So I don't want to overcrowd everything. So now we move on to the eyes. I actually have deceptively simple eyes. It's basically the each Nissan shading process that I do for my regular art, just in a more condensed environment. So for starters, we have to get all our shadows in. We then add some highlights at the bottom, and then we add one more reflective light. Now the reflective light is what makes my uh, eyes kind of pop a bit more. We also will hint or imply eyelashes by cutting off certain parts of it. I also will then add the brights in the eye, basically the highlights or the reflective light. Then I will put all of the color layers into its own separate folder. This is my process, it's a little bit weird, but once we do that, we will then convert the folder into a layer. Make sure you hit the checkbox of keep original layer because the layer we are creating is all the color and we're gonna be using just that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set the mode to overlay, we're gonna blur it, and And then we're gonna reduce the opacity to where it's just adding a little bit of saturation and brightness to it. It really crushes all the levels into something that's like crazy striking. And now for the final step, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a layer above the line art for the eyes. We're gonna set it to add glow. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the base color and the highlight, and we're going to take a saturated version of the base color and we're gonna lightly go over that area. And what it's going to do is it's gonna make the eyes look like they're glowing. It's really nice. I've always liked this. It really makes everything come together. And now comes the part that everyone seems to kind of hide as an artist. I don't know why people don't talk about post-processing more, but a lot of what makes a good artwork pop even more digitally is post-processing. So the first thing I like to do is add a glow. And the way we do that is we're going to go to our color folder. We're gonna to convert to layer, we're gonna duplicate the layer. Then we're going to go to effect, blur, Gaussian blur. Then we're gonna set the layer to overlay. We're then gonna reduce the opacity to somewhere around 20 to 15%. And what that's gonna do is it's going to create a slight glow to the character, which always looks nice. We are then gonna create a layer on top, which is going to be set under soft light. And what we're going to do is we're going to warm up the areas where the highlights are by adding a more saturated red and kind of just going over everywhere where the light touches. Then I add what's known as a tonal curve. Now, I'm gonna explain how to read a tonal curve real quick. So, here we have a basic tonal curve. And what you need to know is that everything on the right is the bright part of the artwork. Everything on the left is the dark and darker tones. In the middle is your mid-tone. So think of it as a gradient. It goes from black to gray to white and everything in between. Now the brighter parts are everything from my highlights to my skin tone. And the thing about those is I definitely want them to be warmer because my light I'm using in particular, especially for this artwork, is a very warm light. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this drop down arrow, we're gonna go to red. So what it means whenever we add a point, especially toward the highlights where we have all of our brights and our skin, when we add a point here and move it up, it means we're adding red. So if we go down, it subtracts red from the area. Now, since I said beforehand I wanted all my skin tone and my highlights to be warmer, I'm going to increase the amount of red there. Also, because our shadows are much cooler, I'll then go to the darker parts and I'll subtract red from the artwork. So we then go to the blue tab. Now, everything we did in the red, we're gonna do the opposite on the blue to really balance out the colors, but also kind of 
push the colors a bit more. So we have blue here. In the highlights, we want less blue. So we're going to subtract blue. And in the shadows, we want to increase the blue. And then lastly, the green tab. Sometimes you can leave the green tab be. In fact, usually you don't even have to mess with them. Um, only if you notice there's a weird green tint to your artwork. If you want to cool down your artwork more or kind of take color away, I would recommend leaving green alone. But for this artwork, what I did was I went to the mid-tone and I just created a small dip in the green. So it's less green all around in the artwork. Also, I add a few loose hair strands just to kind of make it feel like it's more, I don't know, alive. I, I think adding loose hair strands looks nice. I don't know. I don't always do it, but I like it. I then add some chromatic abrasion. And this is a photo editing technique. It adds an effect that blurs everything and kind of shifts them. Uh, what, what it does is it takes the red screen tone and the blue screen tone and the green screen tone slightly shifts them. Now, what I recommend is Clip Studio Asset Store has a few auto processes that do this for you. You can also look up a tutorial on how to do chromatic abrasion on the side. Um, I personally use an asset and I didn't pay for it, so you're probably gonna have to either pay for it or look up how to do it because I found doing it on Clip Studio Paint to be annoyingly difficult on your own. I then add a few dust particles using the droplet tool in the um, in the airbrush setting in um, Clip Studio Paint. And then I just adjust the size of the particles. Um, nothing too crazy, but what this does is it adds a little bit of eye candy. Make sure you follow the movement of the composition, just to kind of add little things to look at whenever people are looking around your artwork. And lastly, we have a little bit of level correction. What I wanted to do was darken up the artwork a little bit and make the colors really pop. So I'm not adding much to it, but I'm adding enough. And overall, it just adds a little bit more. Also, I did add one extra thing. I did a hue and saturation filter and I increased the saturation a bit just to make the colors really, really stick out. And that was the process for this artwork. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, comment, subscribe, let me know how I did. Uh, ring the bell if you'd like to see more. I plan to be uh, doing more of these videos. And overall, I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, leave a comment if you would like anything specific, any tutorials. I might make a few tutorials in the future. And thanks for watching. Bye.